Matt Rose, a 1981 alumnus of the True Last College of Business, is CEO and chairman of BNSF Railway Company. The company employs more than 40,000 people across 28 states and two Canadian provinces and moves people, products, and raw materials across more than 32,500 miles of railroad. Can you tell us what some of the lessons are that you learned while studying business and how that's helped you build this amazing career? Sure. Well, what I tell all young people about college is it's really about the ability to learn. I don't believe that I've taken any of the actual studies that I learned at college, but I had to learn a lot about how to study and how to learn. And then you take those right into business. And if you can do that, that's where you're going to be really successful. Mm -hmm. So since 2004, in more recent times, industry leaders, including you, have been saying that we're in the midst of a rail renaissance. Yeah. And you've said this to our students when we've brought them down to visit you. Can you tell us what that statement means to you? Sure. So if you think about the big infrastructure build outs of our country, it was our parents grand and their parents, their grandparents who built these things. The National Highway System built in the 50s and the 60s under the Eisenhower presidency. The port infrastructure, the railroads, which were built 150 to 160 years ago. But we really haven't built any of these big infrastructure projects mm -hmm. in our generation. And so as the economy continues to grow and as population grows, most importantly, and if you go back to the, the 50s and the 60s, we had 200 million people. Today we have 309 million people. Mm -hmm. And people consume things, they buy things, they go to Walmart, Home Depot, Lowe's, Target, Sears. And so what's happening is that we're seeing more and more congestion. Mm -hmm. So if you go out to I-70, what do you see? Lots of trucks moving back and forth, east and west, traversing the overall country, delivering goods. And so railroads, which were once almost given up for dead in the late 70s, are now really experiencing this rail renaissance. So it sounds like the future is very bright for the industry. What elements do you look to that will either continue to cause this growth or perhaps stall it? Well, we're really a, a great uh, barometer of the U.S. economy. So if you were to say, what's the one thing, it, it always comes back to how's the U.S. economy going to do, specifically the consumer. Mm -hmm. So today about 65 to 70 percent of all of our uh, commerce in this country, all of our GDP is consumer driven. And that's why you get so much uh, interest in consumer sentiment. How are people feeling? Well, when your house is underwater, people aren't feeling good, so they're not going to go out and buy things. But as the consumer grows in population and then also begins to exercise that very affluent buying power, then they're going to buy things. And when you buy things, you have to ship them. And hopefully, you'll put them on our railroad. I hope so too. <laughs> so the National Surface Transportation Policy and Revenue Study Commission estimated that without rail, the country would need nine new airports the size of Denver's yeah. and would need to double the current 49,000 miles of interstate highways that those trucks are going down that you described by the year 2040. Those figures shocked me when I saw them. I'm yeah. sure they would shock the average consumer. What do you think about those projections? Well, I think they're they're really tied to population growth again. And, and so the, the the forecasters think that we'll go from this 309 million people to about 350 million people in the next 40 years. And when that happens, again, the economy is going to grow, people are going to buy houses, cars. So I think it's really going to uh, turn out that way. And if you, if you think about, again, how much we've added to these big infrastructure projects, if you just look at the national highway system, uh, we've actually added about 7% more lane miles since the original build out. But we're actually up about 100% in what we call VMTs or vehicle miles traveled. So again, we're adding more and more demand to these infrastructure networks, but we're not creating the capacity. And so that's going to cause congestion and it's going to cause a real need to continue to add lane miles as well as rail miles. That's a very interesting problem to have, an interesting challenge. So looking just beyond that demand in the United States that you were just describing, let's talk a little bit about global demand, international yeah. challenges. How do you think globalization as it's going right now will influence transnational transportation in the future? And how do you look at the fact that railroads are by design, by inherently right. landlocked relative to global demand? Yeah, so if you go back to the old railroad that uh, your parents read little books to you about, uh, it was it was raw materials into a factory, mm -hmm. produce something, and then ship it out probably by truck or by rail. Today's globalization means raw materials shipped from the inland part of the United States, goes to the West Coast, gets on a boat, goes over to Asia, gets manufactured, comes back, maybe in a uh, UPS or a FedEx jet, or maybe on a steamship line boat, comes to the coast, gets remanufactured, 
uh, rehandled and then gets put into the railroad network from there. So globalization has really been uh, quite a boon to the railroad industry. Mm -hmm. And when you think about uh, what our country does export, right at the top is agricultural products. And again, our ability to be competitive in this global market is really tied to transportation and railroads can provide a huge asset there. So let's talk about those various modes of transportation you were just referring to. Projected demand for passenger and freight rail within the next couple of years is expected to reach $214 billion, which is incredible. Yep. But as you said, there are other forms of transport, ocean freight, trucking, et cetera. How do you see the market share for rail playing out given these various forms of transportation yep. available? So if you believe that our country is going to continue to grow, and if you believe that our country is not going to have a lot of excess money to put in the highway system, if you believe that someday we're going to price carbon as a society, uh, and if you believe that our economy is going to continue to grow, rail has a great sweet spot, even as the other modes of transportation grow as well. Steamship lines, ocean shipping, airports, land, water, highways. So let's talk about that carbon footprint that you just referred to. A lot of people might be surprised to learn, I was, although I've heard you mention this a couple of times now when we've visited, that it is the, that the rail industry or rail is the second lowest producer of emissions in transportation categories and that there's a lot of investment going on in even bringing that down right. further. So this is sort of an obvious question, but I'd like to hear your thoughts on the value of that investment given that you're coming in at a very low emissions rate as it is right now. So we run a fun little ad as an industry that says we can move one ton of freight, uh, 500 miles on one gallon of diesel. So think about that. One ton of freight, one gallon of diesel, 500 miles. And as with most particulate matter and um, all the various SOX, NOx, carbon, most of that is all really tied to fuel efficiency. Mm -hmm. So we are extremely fuel efficient. So we already have a, a, a step up on the rest of the competition, i.e. the, the over-the-road trucker. Uh, but it's something that we know that as people do begin to think about pricing carbon, whether it's in a cap and trade or a carbon tax or anything like that, we believe the value of continuing to reduce our emission is going to pay huge dividends for us. Absolutely. Another investment that you're making in sustainability that we were very interested to learn about was research in natural gas yep. as a fuel for locomotives. What do you think the significance of this research and testing is going to be for the industry? Well, if you think about the shale plays around the country, this is really one of the things that will change our society forever. And one of the byproducts of, of, the, of the tide oils is actually natural gas. And so we have an incredible abundance of natural gas. And we're going to test it again. We actually operated some natural gas locomotives in the 80s. And so we're going to relook at that. We're actually starting the test late of this year, December of 2013, as we sit here today. And we're going to, we're going to actually operate six locomotives and we're going to see how it all functions, and then we'll be looking at the supply chains of where we would get that gas. But right now, when we look forward, gas is going to be relatively cheap, cleaner to burn, and we think it's a great opportunity for us. Well, that's a very cool future uh, revelation that we look forward to hearing more about. And, and speaking of cool, as a representative and an ambassador of the industry, how have you personally approached the brand identity of 21st Century Rail? And did your background in marketing, your studies in marketing, help at all? Well, I don't think if you ask my kids, they would say cool. Uh, <laughs> let's say I got here very at a very young age. And that was really the, the, the big game changer for me. I knew that I was going to be in the CEO role for a long time. I knew that we had a workforce that was going to retire. And I needed to refresh that workforce. And so part of it was marketing to the, the younger generation, if you will, to, to talk about an industry that when they were growing up, all they heard about was the bankruptcies. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like what you hear about of some of the airline industries that have gone through over the last decade. And so we had to rebrand, remarket uh, the railroad uh, to, to really go after the industrial consumer again because we had lost a lot of our way in that area. And so making sure that we had the bright brand identification uh, I think has been helpful to us. Mm -hmm. So your predecessor said, speaking of the youth that you yeah. um, brought to the table, that you knew your successor should be someone who would be around long enough to deal with change. And he explicitly mentioned youth as being one of your strongest attributes. So that was a decade ago. You've been CEA for, CEO for over a decade. What do you think you really brought to the table when that started? And how would you tell the next generation of emerging leaders to position themselves similarly? So when, you're, when you come into the role, as early as I did, you know you've got a long runway. Um, you kind of start by taking a breath and really, really trying to figure out where you want to take the company, the assets, the people, and everything else. 
And we're all, we're all in corporate America, specifically publicly traded companies, are all fixated on the quarterly earnings in the next year and things like that. And yet, I knew what I really needed to do was to take a five, 10 year view out. And so I was able to do that, put into place programs. We still have our leadership model here. And I told people at the time, 13 years ago, I said, this will take a decade for us to really start to see the results. And it indeed has. And so just looking at uh, life a little bit differently, thinking that you're gonna be doing something for the next decade, I think helps to focus uh, the attention on what you need to do. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about how that focus might have played out with specific regard to technology. Yeah. So technology is making your industry a lot more efficient. And we've talked about some of the investments you're making in that area. What type of leaders and experts will you see rising to the top who are able to take advantage of how this technology is emerging? Yeah. So today's uh, generation coming out of college are just so apt, adept to the whole technology platform. and. Uh, the older generation has, be, has, has learned it, but it's been a much, much more difficult transition for them. And so we, we look at uh, the mobile workforce, uh, we look at uh, application management now, and the, the younger generation just picks it up and gets it right away. So it's really helpful because they've grown up with it, and it's really helpful that for them to, for us to see them apply it in the business side. It's actually very fun to teach them too. Yep. They, they teach us a lot about how to stay current and I like to think they help us stay cool too, although I don't think my children would necessarily say any more, uh, would say probably this very same thing that yours have to you. There's been some, speaking of cool, very cool new things emerging with regard to transport, more in the space of human transport as we learn about Hyperloop and yep. Urban Mole. And these are not uh, likely to be obviously direct competitors to what you're doing, but as you look at technology like that, how do you evaluate its impact on what you're doing yeah. over here. So today we woke up and we saw that Amazon is going to move packages via drones. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's always things that are going to uh, be disruptors in every business. We think though that we're an enabler and not a disruptor. And at the end of the day, if you want to ship something from point A to point B, and if it weighs anything at all, chances are it can go on the railroad more efficiently and emit less emissions and, and overall take trucks off the highway, which we think is a great opportunity. With countries like China seeing wages rise 17% per year or more, some are proposing that onshoring or reshoring, more manufacturing in the United States yep. may be in our near-term economic future. And obviously this would be very beneficial to domestic industries, but how do you see it affecting your industry? Yeah, so it'll have some pluses and some minuses. Uh, we believe that it won't initially come back to the United States. We believe it'll make a pit stop down in Mexico because of lower wages, better regulatory environment, uh, lower electric, electrical costs. But certainly the United States manufacturing environment today is much better than it was five years ago. And the real game changer for that is really low cost affordable energy. Uh, low cost affordable energy is the key for so many of our uh, future successes in this country. Manufacturing is at the heart of it. So if it does come back, then instead of bringing it from Asia, we'll haul it in the United States. Well, that sounds like two good options, yeah. but one obviously having a much more domestic right. impact. Warren Buffett says that opportunities abound in America and Berkshire Hathaway companies like this one. Reinvestment history certainly supports that. Apart from the railway opportunities that are leading you to record-breaking capital expenditures this year, where do you see opportunity for economic investment that might have long-term impact? So I think that, uh, again, going back to uh, the energy environment as one big platform, uh, it is really phenomenal of what our country has at its ability as long as we don't screw it up. And we could do that, but it's, it's really going to have a profound impact on our country, on our society, on other people's society, on the issue of whether or not we go fight global wars again, all these various things, just on based on one technology that really five, six, seven years ago wasn't even being implemented. So it's a huge game changer for our country. The second, of course, would be technology. And technology always is at the forefront of any mature economy that needs to change. And we're gonna, we're gonna continue to see a technological change. If you just uh, pick up your iPhone that really, it really wasn't even in existence just six years ago, and think about the change that Steve Jobs created for our economy. And then the third one would have to be healthcare because it's such a large part of our overall economy now. 
uh, the changes that are going to come over the next several years will be exciting as well. Yeah, very exciting. So in your alma mater, the Chulas College of Business, we're celebrating our 100 yeah. year anniversary. It's really quite a legacy. And as we look forward to future investment, we're also looking back and reflecting on how our long history shaped who we are today. In business schools, as in business in general, 100 years is a really long time. But Warren Buffett told you when you started to think of this as a 100-year-old family business. What do you think that means to you now as a leader, now that you have the perspective that you have? And what do you think other leaders could do to benefit from this approach? Yeah, so I think that our country, our capital markets became very short-term uh, focused. And part of that is because the, 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 the stick that we all measure ourselves by is typically stock prices. And stock prices uh, go up and go down, but there's so much uh, pressure on that to drive earnings that I think it does put us into a shorter term view of life. And I think that for some industries that's changing again now. But I think uh, when you think about a 100-year business and you, take, you, you, you look at any of the great companies uh, in the United States today, uh, and, and all of those have had to take a long view of life. And so the business school has a shelf life of four years for every student, really only about two. And so they're going to have to continue to think about how they're going to position their business school uh, for the next generation. And it's going to be a big change from when I went to that business school. It is an interesting and exciting challenge for us. Mm -hmm. And we learn a lot from industry leaders like you. And one of the ways we learn from that is watching your recruitment practices. Mm -hmm. So how is BNSF approaching recruitment and retention of the millennials previously uh, or in, di in ways that are different from previous generations? Yeah. So when you think about the, the, the graduating class of 2014, uh, you can focus on the Harvards and the Stanfords. You can focus on people in specific uh, areas of engineering or business. What we're really looking for, the ideal candidate for us is someone who maybe had to pay a little bit of their way to go to school, maybe had to work a little bit uh, to pay for that as well. Somebody that's had above average grades, but most importantly, somebody who's had a college experience that has shown and demonstrated that they have leadership qualities and they've actually done things while they've been at uh, the business school other than just study and that they've, they've participated in the society in general. That's an interesting approach. It's something we really take to heart in developing our curriculum. So that would really raise a question for you as one of our advisors to give to us as educators. What do you think we as educators need to do to maximize our ability to equip students with what they'll need? Yeah. So a lot of times um, I always start every intern class and every college management trainee class um, I usually start by saying whatever they told you in business school may not apply here. And you know everybody kind of laughs, but I mean really what, what business schools need to focus on is, at least for our industry, and I think for most people's industry is, once the, once the student gets the application of how to study, once the student gets the application of how to make grades, then it's really how's that person going to collaborate? How's that person going to work in a team? Because most businesses, now there are some that are very unique, very individually focused, but, but majority of businesses all create the ability, all have the need to be able to work in teams. And that's a big change for a lot of students. So we love schools that uh, do project stuff. We love schools that um, force the students to work within groups of people to produce projects, things like that. We think it's a big idea. I think it's a big idea too. So let's flip that and look at it from the other side. What do you think a student should do with the opportunity and education offers in order to be ready for the challenges that will face them? Yeah, so a lot of students now, you know, they go to Europe and they backpack for a summer or a year and take a year off. They, they really should go to India or they should go to China. Take a year off and go see the world because our country is a very developed, very mature economy. And the success of our country in the future is gonna be really how we do in the global landscape. And to be able to see the rest of the world, not Paris and France and those places, but to be able to go to Bangkok or go to Vietnam or go to uh, India and see really what's happening in terms of manufacturing, energy, technology, and all these things. It's a unique opportunity very few people get to see. And uh, I, I, I say it on the other end of the spectrum with, with adults. Uh, every time I meet with members of Congress, I always ask them, have you ever been to India? No, <laughs> you ought to go. You ever get, been to China? No, you ought to go. You ought to go and see what the rest of the world is doing because it's going to have a huge impact on our society.
And I want to thank you for taking the time to share your insights with us, with us as educators, with all of our alums and constituencies, and most importantly with our students. So we're very proud to claim you and we'll just as we head into, at the time of filming, our first ever SEC championship Absolutely. game, which is very exciting. <clears throat> I think we are compelled to say M-I-Z. Z-Z-O-U. All right, go, go Tigers. Tigers.